Hello and welcome to James's Wrestling Shoot Interviews with the great and good of professional wrestling. And if there's one thing I've learned over the years, it is pimping ain't easy, but it's necessary. But uh, my guest is not chasing the bitches like Tom Chase Jerry because he is happily married. He's a WWE Hall of Famer and he's right here with me. The Godfather. How you doing, buddy? Brother, I am. Well, I'm a little, little slow this morning. I was with Stone Cold yesterday, but... I'm dragging a little bit, but we're gonna make it through it. <laughs> how uh, how much uh, beer is Jack? Or, uh, in fact, you might have to explain what how come you were stone cold yesterday because this is pretty new information. Okay, well, uh, it, it won't probably be out for another month, but uh, I did the uh, uh, the it's called the Broken Skull podcast with him. Uh, I did an episode with him. Yeah, and uh, we drank a whole bottle of Jack Daniels by ourselves. No chasers, no nothing, just whiskey. And so uh, I'm feeling it today a little bit, but we're going to make it. <laughs> so what, ti- what time are you up till? Uh, no, we were, uh, he lives in Nevada now. I live in Nevada. So it was only an hour flight to his place. I got home like at uh, 8.30 last night. But believe me, at, at 6.30, we were still drinking. But it was only an hour flight. So by the time I got home, I'm just, I never ate. And I was just like, whoa. And so the day I woke up and I'm like, you know, best thing to do is to have another drink. So this, I got a little Jack and Coke in here to help me get through it. Oh, man. I, I don't know what you call it over. We call it over here, hair of the dog. I don't know what you call it. It's hair of the dog is exactly what it is. Cool. It's a big dog too. <laughs> <laughs> is it a triple or more? Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, actually, my intro was uh, Pimpin' Ain't Easy. I want to know, because I assumed it was from Down For Whatever by Ice Cube. I'm a bit of a, I'm a, bit of a hip-hop fan, but it could have been from Big Daddy Kane, or was it from something else entirely where you got Pimpin' Ain't Easy? I, the first time I probably heard it was like Big Daddy Kane and before that. You know, Pimpin' Ain't Easy, that's been around it was since Iceberg Slid, you know. That's, that, that saying's been around forever. Uh you know, I just put it on TV a little bit more. But, you know, Pippin ain't easy. But, you know, what people don't know is I never said Pippin was hard for me. I'm just saying Pippin ain't easy. So don't think it's as easy as Pippin, you know. That was my scoop. <laughs> was, uh, I was, made it look easy. Was there always going to be uh, like a little asterisk? Pippin ain't easy for you. Yeah. <laughs> Right. I, I tell you what, the first thing I was actually going to ask you until the uh, Steve Austin sort of revelation, I saw it on Instagram this morning as well, was um, the last time you were on WWE TV, you were celebrating with The Undertaker, and uh, I was hoping you'd take me to the day, uh, you know, from beginning to end, uh, what was your role in it, or, or was there any other plans going on, and you've got to tell me about the after party as well. Well, you know, we got there the same day, then we, the COVID was really bad at the time, which it still is. So Vince had rented out like three or four floors of the hotel. And to be on those floors, you had to be COVID tested. So there was nobody allowed on any of the floors. There's no fans. There's no nothing. It was just us because of the COVID. And so we, uh, Taker had to do some type. I think he did something with Snoop Dogg or something that day. He had to do some type of podcast with Snoop. So we were waiting for him to show up. And he showed up about 10 o'clock to the bar. And we had started a little early without him. But uh, by the time three, four o'clock rolled up in the morning, we had drank four bottles of Jack Daniels and probably, I don't know how many pints of beer. (laughs) Uh, It was like old times. It was old times and the fact that me and Taker had to put them all to bed like we used to. So we had to walk them all the rooms, make sure to get to the rooms. And then uh, it was a good night. The next day, at the building, we were all, whew, even Taker, everybody was feeling it a little bit. Taker's wife had even told me that Mark had told her, just like old times, man, just me and Papa, and a lot of people call me Papa. He said, me and Papa put people to sleep. But um, good day. I don't really understand what they had us do there. That didn't make much sense to me. But, you know, sometimes you're just better off doing what you're told. Uh, what they did for him with us just was kind of, I don't know if you've seen it. Did you see it? I mean, they kind of had us all, we all got an entrance, all got an intro, and then it went to a B-roll, and then we were all gone. So I don't know what sense that made. I just did. We have a group called BSK that Taker's a part of, and uh, we had our salute celebration the night before. So what they did on TV didn't matter. 
Uh, do you know, I actually spoke to Savio Vega a couple of months ago and I asked him the same question and I was like, who was last man standing? And he was just like, oh, I don't know, man. I don't want to say. Which sort of, to me, sounded like it definitely wasn't him. I don't remember putting Savio to bed. I, I know he was drunk, but I don't, I don't, you know, me and Cake are always in the last man stand. I don't let nobody fool you. Uh, and Savio, Savio don't drink like we drink, but he was a trooper, man. He's a good dude. You know, he's part of BSK. Did you ever get into the uh, gargling of the Jack thing? I, I don't know if that was a good yes, thing. Yes, of course. Of course. Uh, we gargled on the uh, podcast yesterday and told people why. People don't know who started that. That was Kurt Henning. Uh, what, that what, was a Kurt Henning thing. What was the uh, what was the reason for? Is it was it so you could prove yeah. that you? <laughs> we couldn't. We we couldn't prove. We, we were talking about that yesterday, and and like, why did we do it? I don't know. It was just he made you gargle it, and, you, and it just became a thing. Gargle your jack, you know. So I, I why I don't know. I always Maybe had a theory. Make sure you drink it. I, I have no idea why you would gargle it, but it was it became a thing. Yeah, that was exactly that was exactly what my theory was. So you could prove that you didn't do the old Ric Flair, you know, over the shoulder yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, which. After, you know, 10, 15 shots, you know, you're prone to do. <laughs> well, yeah, two for me. I've, I've actually done that as well after a second one. I'm just like, it, it's gone. I, 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 like I told everybody yesterday, I don't drink, but it doesn't mean that I can't drink. I just, I don't choose to drink. But, whew, you know, I'm a big cannabis smoker. I'm much more into that than I am drinking. I, I might even get to the smoking in a bit, but there's one question I've got to ask you. And actually, because you brought up the Broken School sessions, I think it is. Um, the Undertaker was on not too long ago, and he told the story where you and he almost came to blows uh, while you think you were traveling in Memphis, and it was a bit of a snowy evening. Now, we've heard his version of the story. I'd love yours. Ooh. It's just like he said. Only thing I don't agree with him on is when um, I took over the car after he drove for, it's a three hour drive from Nashville to Memphis, Memphis to Nashville. Uh, it was, like he said, it was a blizzard outside, man. And uh, I was just determined to drive my car. And he tried to talk me out of it, said, dude, he calls me Bear. He's like, Bear, don't, you don't know how to drive in the snow. You live in California, you know, I've never drove in the snow in my life, you know? But I had to drive. And I'm type of dude, especially back then, that you couldn't tell me no. If you told me no, and then I was determined to do it. So I'm like, no, it's my car. I'm going to drive. So it was me, him, dirty white boy, dirty white girl. And um, her name was Kim, and he was Tony Anthony. His real name was Tony Anthony. And so uh, I, I took over the car. Taker says that I got like 10 feet, and I put the car into a spin and put us into a ditch. I disagree. I think I went at least 10 yards. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, man, but we, we didn't almost come to blows on that. The, the, the one that we, we went to blows on was when we were fighting over one of these hats. I don't know if you heard that. No, one. I've never heard of that one. Go ahead, please. That was on the first, on the first uh, Stone Cold podcast with him. He talked about me and him getting into a fight, a real fight over a hat. And then on the second one, he told the uh, snow story, I think, or vice versa, one of the two. Uh, so, so what was the hat? Was it just he wanted that style of hat first? Uh, I had, I've been wearing these hats forever. And uh, I had bought one that was a Stetson. It was more of a riverboat, you know, instead of Godfather style, it was riverboat. It was flat on the top. And uh, we used to give each other, I mean, he'd give me this Rolex watch. I'd give him this. He'd give me that. We always give it back. So one, I said, he tried on my hat. And I'm like, bro, it looks better on you than me. And he's like, no, nah, I ain't taking the hat. And I'm like, no, you're going to take the hat. And he's like, no, I'm not going to take the hat. So he goes in the bathroom, locks the door, he's going to the bathroom. And I, I mean, you really have to go on the podcast and, and see it because it's, you know, it's animated. They put stuff to it. And so I basically broke down the door and we start fighting. And we were fighting in front of a lot of people, you know. And uh, well, before that, when I broke down the door, he's like, oh, yeah, he took the door and put his head through the door. And then he went outside, 
through the, the door. We were on the second floor, like down to the parking lot. And then he came back in. That's when I attacked him. And But the moral to the story, and I'm like I said, you really have to look it up. It's, it's a pretty good story. The moral to the story is he took the hat. <laughs> and he even says it at the you know, end. He goes, I, I, I took the hat, though. <laughs> I've got to, I'm going to ask you a couple more quick Undertaker questions first. And one thing that came to light a few years ago was the cucumber thing. Please explain the cucumber thing with Undertaker. That's just so odd to me. Um, all I know about it, this is uh, all I know about it. He don't like cucumbers. He don't want them on his food. He don't like to see them. He don't like to touch them. I never ribbed him about it. Um, it was never a big deal. More people make a big deal out of it than me. I don't know if the story is somebody ribbed him or something. But it's, I've known him since 88, 1988. And he just, for some reason, he don't like cucumbers. But like I said, I never ribbed him, like put cucumbers on his bed or any of that stuff. I never did that. So if there's a story to it, I don't know it. I know that he does not like cucumbers. <laughs> well, clearly a good friend as well, if you're not going to. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'm clearly somebody who knows who the judge is usually going to be on wrestler's court as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's, they don't have that anymore, I don't think. No. Uh, do you uh, do you ever remember getting taken to wrestlers' court, or do you remember any good stories back in the day of uh, someone who was tried for something? I took D'Lo to wrestlers' court one time. Right. Uh, this is over cannabis. We were in Chicago, and D'Lo was from that area, and he's like, dude, when we go to Chicago, don't worry about it. I got you covered. I'm going to get you the fire. It's going to be the best you ever... I'm like, okay, man, so... I tell my people, no, 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 don't worry about it. I'm covered. So long story short, D'Lo comes to my room with the worst looking, it looked like a bag of weeds. And so because it was maybe 12 o'clock at night, I couldn't get any that night and I need it. And so at TV, I was going to take him to court for misrepresenting good weed. And so he settled out of court with me because he knew Taker was going to put it to him. And uh, he settled out of court with me. But, dude, there was a lot of wrestling court stories. Um, there, it was a big thing back in the late 80s and early 90s. I don't remember them all. But, there, there was, dude, there was a lot of them. It was a weekly thing. And the thing that was cool about it, there was no office people allowed. If you weren't a wrestler, you weren't allowed in. Rightly so. Yeah. Rightly so. I'll tell you what, right? I'm going to, um, obviously, we've been doing a lot of Undertaker. I'm going to bring it back. And I'm actually going to go back to the USWA. So I found out that you were actually discovered tending bar while the film Over the Top was being filmed. Yes, yes. I've got to ask, you're a massive dude. You must have tried at least a couple of the pro arm wrestlers or maybe Scott Norton or something while you were uh, on the bar. No, man. I was never, you know, that's a technique. You got to, you can't just be strong to be an arm wrestler. You got to learn it. I, I was never an arm wrestler. I was a manager, bartender, bouncer at a strip club in Vegas. It was right down the street from the MGM where they filmed that. Filmed that. Well, Scott Norton and other people in that movie would come to my bar where I worked. And I was just massive, man. I was just this big tattooed dude. And they were like, I didn't even know who they were. I wasn't a wrestling fan. I was a roller derby fan <laughs> and I, because, I, you know, back in the uh, back in the 70s, man, the 75, 76, 77, man, uh, roller derby was probably bigger than wrestling in the Bay Area, in California. And so um, these guys are like, well, you should try it. I'm like, man, I don't want to do that phony stuff. I'm not a phony person. And basically what I told them. And then they said, well, have you heard of Bam Bam Bigelow? And I'm like, yeah, I've heard of Bam Bam. The dude with the tattoos on his head. And they're like, well, he made a million dollars last year. And I went, what? And that's how I got into wrestling because I, I made a call. Dude, it happened so fast for me. I mean, I literally made a call. I went to a wrestling school. They took one look at me. They're like, oh, no, okay, we got you. I was in wrestling school for, you're supposed to be there probably a year or so. I was maybe there a month. Jerry the King Lawler seen me, uh, and he offered me a job. So my very first wrestling, wrestling match ever, I mean, ever, I didn't hardly know anything, was against Jerry the King Lawler in Memphis, Tennessee on a Monday night, which is a big thing, and I beat him. And that was my first match. I became USWA heavyweight champion. 
Wow. I'll tell you, how many thousands? I'm sure there were thousands there. Because that was, was that the Mid-South Coliseum at the time, wasn't it? Yes, Mid-South in Memphis, yes, sir. Yeah. So um, I always hear the stories or I always read the stories that there was like that one good arena and then there was some real podunk, horrible places that you have to wrestle, you know, maybe midweek or, you know, a spot show here and there. Do you remember some of the absolute like worst venues that you wrestled in? It, well, they weren't that bad. <clears throat> Back then, wrestling for the USWA, I think, sat, let me see, Saturday morning, you had uh, you had to be in Memphis for TV. Saturday night, you had to be in Nashville. Monday, you had to be back to Memphis, which was the nice Coliseum. Tuesday, you were in Louisville, which was a decent place. And then Wednesday, you were in Evansville, which wasn't that nice, but then I... Uh, they, there wasn't a lot of bad places back then. So the I mean, ones like the what do you mean by the, bad? So it was like n no, like the old hay barns and the uh, car parks I and the. Never worked. No. All oh, right. That... No, I never worked in those type of. That's like indie stuff. And yeah. I, I never worked in anything like that. Uh, I've got. We've always ask. had a roof over our head and a lot. The Sportatorium is probably one of the worst places I ever wrestled. That was a, just important. Um, the Sportatoria, there was a lot of history there. I mean, everybody who's anybody wrestled there, the Von Erichs, and I mean, everybody, but it was the worst building in the world. They had no, I'm just adjusting my camera. They had no uh, lockers. Uh, they had no lockers. They had no showers. I think they had one bathroom and all the wrestlers dressed in a small, small room, but there was a door <laughs> on each side of the room I mean, and it wasn't it's a small room and so the good guys would go out on this side and the, and the heels would go out on this side it was funny but it was just a really small room where you it was better to show up ready to go because there was no it was it was just it was a shithole <laughs> but uh not a lot of history there i mean they knocked it down but it had a lot of history there yeah my next question was going to be uh did you ever feel the wrath of one of bill dundee's working punches um, I didn't work much with Bill. I worked with Lawler. I didn't work much with Bill Dundee at all. And when I worked with Bill Dundee, um, he, uh, we were in tag teams and stuff. It was like me and Taker against him and Dutch Mantel or something. No, nah, he never, he, he, he never stiffed me. <laughs> I didn't work with him much. No, he probably, if he stiffed me, I didn't, it wouldn't have been good. No, but no, I mean, I have no, no problems with him. He, uh, but I didn't work much with them. One more thing, right? So I believe after the first WWF run, you went back to USWA. Um, and there's a couple of things I was going to ask. But the first one is, this wasn't the first place that you uh, wrestled Owen Hart. I believe that was in Germany or worked with him. But um, how was it like working Owen Hart back in those days? I'm going to ask you a couple of Owen Hart questions. because I first time I wrestled Owen Hart was in Japan. Oh. And uh, he he really helped me out. He showed me how to uh, order food, get around, get to the gym. And then I went to Germany with Otto Vons. And I was on a long tour with him. On that tour was also Scott Hall, Fit Finley, Dave Taylor, Chris Benoit, Razor Ramon, PM News. And that's all the guys that were there when I was there. But we were in Germany for like eight months. I was going to... Uh... <laughs> I had a bit of a cheeky question. I was actually going to say, uh, you wrestled with some pretty big names in Germany and also PN News. Oh. <laughs> so, ah, oh, never mind. I, I, well, I'll tell you what, let's go straight to the uh, German tours then. So do we, I'd actually be more familiar with them because I'm slightly too young to get the British wrestling, but I'm very familiar with the round system. So how does one tailor uh, your uh, style to uh, the round system rather than the American style? Oh, it's easy, man. It, work is working, bro. It just, you know. You learn real quick because, you know, you it, it takes seconds to learn. All you have to do is watch a round match and then just change your psychology up. It, it's not difficult at all. It's kind of cool. Um, I enjoyed Germany. I really did. I had a great time over there. Uh, I learned a lot. But see, the type of it was called catch wrestling. Catch wrestling was different than this wrestling. I mean, the same concept. But it was a little, you know, with the rounds different. But it wasn't hard to master. It was It was fun. Mm. And it because it would be the things it would be the things that you did in between the rounds, like you had a break between rounds, and of course the heel would try to do stuff. And it was 
it was fun. You just had to change your psychology up, which was good about it is you got to learn another style. Japan was a whole nother style. American wrestling was a whole nother style. But you just adapted, man. And it was, uh, and if you could work, you could work. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I suppose you had quite a lot of practice to uh, do it in Germany because I believe you were in a caravan and you were static and you were just in the same place for weeks on end wrestling, exact, <laughs> you know, just wrestling every day in front of the same fan. So you had to get good but, quick. But there's no traveling. There's no traveling. And, and me and Steve talked about this yesterday. One of the hardest things about wrestling is not wrestling, it's the traveling. You travel so much. And so you would be like, we'd be in Hanover. We'd be in Hanover for 42 days. And you're in a caravan or you're in a trailer. I guess you call them caravans. And it's pretty cool. I never stayed in the caravans. I always, always, to be honest, I would go out and find girls and stay with their <laughs> houses. And then yeah, that's what I did because I would, oh, believe me. But uh, I, I, I stayed in the caravans for like three weeks. And then I just said, man, I could go stay with this girl, go stay with that girl. So that's what I did. But it was cool, man. And you're at the same building. Food's available. Um, it, it's, it, was, it was a learning experience and a good one, man. I have nothing but good memories of that time. Yeah. Do you remember Otto Vance as well? Did you ever get in the ring with him? Because I know he was a pretty mobile Many guy. Times. Maybe. He was a mobile I've guy in the seventies. I've taken the big auto, brother. I've taken the big auto. Uh, <laughs> good dude. People don't know that he used to do strongman feats, and he used to be, have the record for being able to rip a phone book faster than anybody. Yeah. Good dude, man. Yeah. Good guy. He he took care of me, and uh, it was he was. They called me Rocky Las Vegas. That was my name, Rocky Las Vegas. So he was a fair payoff man as well. Would you say? Yes, at the time. At the time, and they had it set up to where all my money was being shipped directly home. And so that's another reason I was like living with girls and stuff. I wasn't spending no money. I was up to just have it. And you'd go to the you'd go to the, the spots at night, you know, and they'd give you free drinks and people it was it was you're treated like a, a, a like a star, you know. You you're like a big star over there. It was great. I had a great time. So we'll sort of, <clears throat> because of, uh, I over-prepare rather than under-prepare. I've got so many questions, so I'm going to have to skip so many, but and we'll go straight to the WWF. And I was wondering who uh, in the office in WWF uh, first discovered you and then brought you in. Who gets the credit for that? In the office? I think Taker told them. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I think Taker probably said, hey, you got to take a look at my buddy. And that's how they found out about me. When I came back from Germany, Taker was, when I went to Germany, Taker was going to WCW. See, Taker went to Japan. And then when he came back, I went to Japan. Okay. When I came back to USWA, he went to WCW. I went to Germany. When I got back from Germany, he's in WWF. So I got a, uh, they gave me a tryout and they hired me. And Vince said, you know, he says, we're going to put you on payroll. Just keep working out, stay in shape. He goes, we got to come up with something for you. He says, you have a body of a monster. He says, but you got a big face. And so he goes, we got to come up with something to, to get rid of that face. They didn't want, <clears throat> they didn't want me to be baby face. They wanted me to heal. They wanted this big monster heal. And so they, they covered my face. That's how they did. They painted my face because I had such a baby face and I did. Do you, um, you couldn't have been the soul taker, I suppose, because it would have been too close to the undertaker. Was that ever discussed? Never. They probably didn't even know about the soul taker, you know? They probably didn't even know. I, that's weird that he, I mean, I, it's weird that he became the undertaker, but it had nothing to do with the soul taker. What was Sir Charles? Sir Charles was, my tryout was in Phoenix, and Charles Barkley played basketball there. And so they wanted to put heat on me. So Vince is like, let's call him Sir Charles and it'll make, you know, everybody be booing him because I'm calling myself Sir Charles. Used it one time for my tryout. That's the only time I was ever Sir Charles. What was the outfit like to sort of like compliment the Sir Charles thing? Because when I think of Sir Dude, Charles. I probably, <clears throat> I probably came out with like soul taker stuff, probably just a black singlet and some black stuff. I don't, I, to be honest, I don't remember. It was just a tryout and a dark match. Nobody, you know, nobody, it's not on tape anywhere. Not, nobody's going to ever see it. It was just a tryout match. But he hired me right away. And when I came back, he says, we're going to hire you. 
And they tell me what he's going to do. And I'm like, cool. I'm still under contract with them to this day. Yeah. Is it a legends contract now? I've been on a legends. Co- I've probably been on. I don't, I don't think they've been around that long. But I got on it in 2003. And I don't think they had it much before that. Um, very few people are on it now, though. They've been, they've been, you know, knocking people off of that legends thing for a while. I'm one of the few one. I think I have two more years on my contract, but I, I'm, they're going to renew it because my characters were just so memorable that from Papa Shango and the Warrior to the Nation of Domination to uh, Godfather to all that, that people still remember a lot of that, which is cool. Well, you know, they just what? came out with a new comma action figure. You know what? I was thinking, actually, because if you're still under a Legends contract, it'd be really good to, you know, for the figures, the dolls they make, because you have so many different outfits with the Godfather character alone. Yeah. You know, you can make a hundred different dolls just from that. Uh, they never made a comma action figure, and they just sent me some. I have one right over here. They're, they're pretty cool looking. You want to see it? Yeah. <laughs> here you go. It's right here. This is it here. Ah, sweet. This oh, you've got the uh, uh, the urn chain as well on it. Yeah, it's got the... They're, look, they're trying to find that chain right now. Oh, is but it yeah, the, that's uh, the new com- archives? They've never made a comma action figure, too, so that's pretty cool. They're doing that show, I don't know what it's called, but where they search for old treasures. <clears throat> they're trying to find that chain. But they don't know. I don't have no idea where it is. I probably threw it away or gave it to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's not like at least Tito Santana when he was done with the old Intercontinental Championship he just threw it in the bin and just walked off that'd be worth a million pounds now or dollars yeah <laughs> uh, going back onto Papa Shango I mean obviously it's Baron Semedi from Live and Let Die uh, one of the better Roger Moores and I'm a big Bond fan but uh, who actually decided that you would be a good fit for it Vince called me at the club and I remember because the doorman said Vince McMahon's on the phone. I'm like, yeah, right, he is. So I get yeah, out. He goes, Charles, Vince. I'm like, oh, shit, it is Vince. <laughs> this is exactly what he said as far as I can remember. He said, Charles, I want you to go rent the movie Live and Let Die. He said, there's a voodoo character in there that we're going to take off of. And I already knew. I already knew who it was. I knew the movie. I was a big James Bond fan, too. And then I remember the laugh. He was also the guy that played him. I, he, I can't think of his name. It was Jeffrey something. But he died a while ago. But he, he was also the Uncola man, and he had that laugh. <laughs> and so I stole that laugh and everything. And that's where it was taken from. Do you remember um, maybe your first uh, real sit-down meeting with Vince McMahon? Was it at the house, or was it just at TV taping, and uh, you discussed the character It there? was at his office at Stanford, Connecticut. And the first person I met was Howard Finkel, God rest his soul. And then Howard says, Vince is uh, in a meeting. He's going to be about an hour and a half. He says, if if you like, we're going to get you something to eat. He goes, if you want to go to the gym and work out. I'm like, oh, I'd rather go to the gym and work out. So I went and worked out, took a shower. They came and got me, and they took me up to his office. And that's the first time I met him. Do you, uh, do you remember? Because 1992 was like such a strange year for the WWF because there were so many... Out of the ring issues, you know, like lawsuits and scandals and stuff of that nature. Was that anything that... Still are. Well, still are. (laughs) Still are. But there seems to be like piles and piles and piles of stuff going on at the same time. And obviously Hulk Hogan was leaving and House were down a bit. Was there any point like chatting in the locker room about that? Or did you just not care? Were you just happy to be on the uh, tour? Um... The wrestlers look at it different than other people. Everybody was just looking for ways to make it better, you know, because uh, everybody wants to make more money. Um, you know, it was just a dead point. That was the, between the Hogan's Way Out and then the, the makings of the Rocks and the Stone Colds and all that. It was just a little dead point. But, you know, everybody was trying. Money was bad. And that's why anytime you see me, that I've been back and forth so many times with so many characters because I always had the strip clubs here in Vegas and you make good money in them. So I could have survived without wrestling. So wrestling was fun to me when it wasn't fun anymore. I would leave. That's why you'd see me leagues. I wasn't having fun. And then they'd, they'd, they'd call me back and I'd be like, nah, I don't really want to come back. And they'd be like, come on. I'd be like, nah, I don't really. They're like, well, we'll let you do this. I'm like, okay. And it just, you know, wrestling was always fun to me. 
Um, it's also because I had another source of income. Uh, I will ask this as well because in 1992, this is when they started doing, you know, the 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 the, the wee test, the piss tests. Do you remember getting there and just thinking, "God, this is weird. I, I didn't quite sign up for this." Um, actually, I never I never smoked weed until after Papa Shango I, in my life. I smoked. I tried it for the first time at 28 years old, and that's because I was going through a divorce. I was Papa Shango. I was going through a real ugly divorce. And I went to LA and a friend of mine's like, try this. And I tried it and I'm like, whoa, my back feels better. And I'm like, you know, my knees don't feel as bad anymore. And I'm like, we're eating. I'm like, this food really tastes good. And then we went to the gym and I had the best workout. So at that point, I was taking a lot of pills, a lot of prescription drugs and stuff like that and drinking a lot. And uh, it really weaned me off of that. I mean, I'll have a drink now and then, but uh, I don't take any prescription pills anymore. Not any, not any whatsoever. And I think that saved me. But uh, uh, yeah, I took a lot of drug tests. <laughs> As when I came back, yeah, I mean, the boy, I used, used to show up at the TV. They'd be like, there's a piss test today. You'd be like, oh, shit, here we go. <laughs> Did they make you do the... I won't pull me t-shirt, but the old t-shirt up, trousers down kind of routine. No, we called them we called them pecker checkers, yeah. and somebody would stand there and watch you, so you didn't do any foolishness. So we called them pecker checkers, and, but they didn't really check that close. But they would sit there and watch, and the guys would tell me as I was as I was taking the test, they'd tell me, "Godfather, you know you smell just like marijuana." And I'm like, "Dude, I was just smoking before I walked in here, so <laughs> why are we even taking this fucking test? I don't know why you guys know that." I'm you guys know I smoke every day. Just tell me how much. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've answered this a few times, right? Uh, and you didn't even know, you weren't in trouble or anything like that, but you didn't even know you were late for WrestleMania 8 on the main event. I know you've told the story again, but please, uh, back in, uh, you know, from the from when you were in gorilla position to I, what happened. I, I, to this day, I don't know what happened. I, here's the thing. I'm, I'm in the WWF. I'm in the main event. I know what I have to do. What they're doing is because they, I was so green that they said, don't go until we send you. I'm like, all right. So I'm not even watching the monitors. I'm just waiting for them to say, go. And I'm going to run down there and do my thing. Well, the person in charge forgot to tell me to go. And all of a sudden he goes, oh, go, 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 go. Well, I was already late. And so when I got there, I, all I knew was what I was supposed to do. And apparently he had to kick out of the, uh, out of the uh, leg drop or whatever, but I'm not a big Hogan fan anyway. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, but I never heard about it. I never heard one thing about it, not one thing from anybody. And later on, when I would start doing signings and stuff, people would come up and say, hey, what happened? And I'm like, what do you mean what happened? And I had no idea. And I'd say, well, what happened? Well, that's what happened. And I never was, I never heard about it because it wasn't my fault. And they probably said, why was Godfather, why was Papa Shango late? And the person said, man, I sent him late. Uh, if I was, well, it doesn't matter because he kicked out of it anyway. So, I mean, hey, it is what it is. <laughs> uh, not my fault. <laughs> uh, not my fault. <laughs> Not your fault. Absolutely not your fault. Uh, just because you mentioned now, it before. If, if I was, if I was, if I had been there longer and knew the system better, I wouldn't have relied on anybody to tell me when to go. And that's where they messed up because, I, you know, they should, they should have just said, I, you know, at this part go. That way, I could have just took our running. <laughs> Did you? Uh, I take it you didn't do like a uh, earlier in the day, just like do a test to see how far the ring was no, from the. They didn't know. Well, they didn't do stuff like that back then. Yeah. Uh, because you just mentioned it before, and I was actually going to ask later, uh, you said you weren't a fan of Hulk Hogan. Was this like always, or was this in light of recent comments? Um, I'm just going to say this. I'm just going to say, um, <laughs> uh, my mom always says, if you don't got something good to say about somebody, don't say nothing. So, no, I just, people in that position, such as Stone Cold, such as Undertaker, such as The Rock, they're just a lot nicer people. And I'm going to let it go at that. Okay. They're just a lot nicer people. Okay. 
Um, well, what I was going to ask beforehand was you were, uh, I believe, going to have a, a run with Sid afterwards. And it's funny that I didn't even mean to mention the test, but I believe he pissed hot and then your feud with Sid was completely gone. Is that is that how it happened? Or? No. Oh, no. right. I was never supposed to work with Sid. Right. Sid was supposed to work with the warrior. Okay. And then Sid didn't want to do the job for him. So Sid took off. And this is exactly what happened. They were building me as Papa Shango. And this is exactly what happened. This is the people in the office said, and they're in the meeting and they said, quit. What are we going to do? And then says, who's got any steam on them? Only person who's got any steam on them right now is Papa Shango. Bam. They never had plans for me to go on beyond Warrior with him. That was just something to do real quick until I think they got Macho Man ready. So there was never, that's that's all bullshit. You know, what happened to Papa Shango is he got thrown through the wolves. <laughs> yeah, I got caught up in the system and, and you got used. And then once you got used, and which is not a bad thing because you're in main events every night, you're getting paid. But then you went from, who was it, Warrior to Brett to Taker to you just went down the line for a couple of years, put people over, but you made good money, you know? Do you um, remember which of the uh, Papa Shango curses were your favorites and which ones you maybe could have done without, or did you just love them all? I, dude, they were all real. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a real, I'm not a real voodoo priest, but uh, everything I was saying was real. And we had a we had books of real curses and stuff. And I was what I was doing was real. I was having only thing I didn't like about I wish I wasn't so green because I could have like I used to have matches with Kamala as Papa Shango, and they were just horrible matches. And then I realized later in life that it wasn't that it was Kamala's fault. It was my fault because he was so much better at his gimmick than I was at mine that it just didn't work. But I wish I I wish I could have did it later in life because I'd have done a better job. I would have known how to work with that gimmick. I never was a, I was never a voodoo man in my life. So all of a sudden I'm a voodoo man out there shaking and stuff. I mean, it wasn't something easy to pull off. <laughs> Do you uh, are you a bit sad that you and Ultimate Warrior never got onto pay per view before he uh, left? No, no. Okay. There's other people that don't see Warrior, bro. I've worked with everybody, man. And the pay would have been the same. I've worked with everybody on the top. So, no, I, mean, I, I don't even think that way. I am not a mark for the business, and I'm not a mark for myself. It was a job for me. It was a way to be around crazy people that are just like me. It was a way to just have fun. And that's what it was for me. And it was, it, and I respect the business. I uh, made some money in the business, met a lot of good friends in the business, but I'm out of the business now. I mean, I, I don't even watch anymore. I don't watch TV at all. And it's hard to watch wrestling right now because there's no fans. And it's kind of, for me, it's just one of the sports you almost kind of need fans. Hmm. What's he like as a person? Because I know uh, Undertaker had a feud with him the year before. So did he give you any advice on like how to handle him? Or uh, was he no. just like a cool guy behind the scenes? Or, you know, did he, what most, was he like to most drive? people... Most people didn't care for him and he didn't do anything to change their opinion of him, but he was cool with me. I don't know if he was cool with me because he wasn't threatened by me, but he was real cool with me, man. I had no problems with Jim. You know, I had no problems with all. I mean, he was the one putting over that voodoo and all that stuff. So, I mean, God bless him, man. You know, he's the one that put made it, made it because when he threw up and take, you know, so no, I had no problems with him. He's just a different cat, man. He's just a different dude. And I, I know a lot of different people, but I had no problems with him. Most of the guys didn't care for him. Uh, I'll go skip ahead a bit more then, because uh, as I say, I've just got a billion questions for you and I've been your ear all day if I could. But um, So let's go straight to the karma. Uh, first karma thing. So the BSK click thing, is that just sort of really overblown and to be honest actually you're all really friends. way you're overblown you just basically all just friends and it's way overblown i'm not i i'm friends with everybody in the clique i'm friends with everybody in bsk that's been blown out of proportion any type of feud between the two of us has been blown they were more political and we were more just friends and we were guys that hung out together friends drank together fought together all that type of stuff uh, we weren't concerned about the click. We had no problems with the click. 
the click wouldn't have lasted long against BSK anyway. I mean, we had all the Harper hitters. But no, man, I, I was friends with Sean, X Pac, Razor. I'm, I'm friends with Hunter. To this day, I'm friends with those guys. Yeah, I mean, you're so friendly. I can't imagine you having some sort of like weird turf war over it. Well, I'm telling you, I'm not the same person if I'm not smoking. <laughs> I know that sounds funny, but I have to. It, it, I have to. I really have to. All right. Within a two or three days, my personality changes. So for me, it's almost it's it's a medical thing. I really need it. I'm not as bad as I used to be, but I used to be like we Papa Sean going earlier. I wasn't a nice person. I was I wasn't a bully, but I wasn't a nice person. I was pretty mean. Cannabis, <coughs> excuse me, cannabis and my wife made me a lot nicer person. And I've been married now 21 years. And uh, her and we made me a lot nicer person. <laughs> I know you're looking. I know you're looking just off camera there. That there's a bit. Have have a hit if you want to have a hit, man. Don't don't be on. You know, airs and grace. Oh, don't worry about me, man. I'll be smoke. <laughs> I got to do smoking videos after this. <laughs> Plus, I got to go get a shot today. I got to go get my second shot. One thing I really did what, what want to ask you was in '96. So you left WWF like in the beginning of '96, and um, you. I think you went back to the strip club. And then I started doing the band, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the managing of the strip club and everything. Uh, when did you start negotiating with WCW? Um, my contract was coming up as Godfather. And that's just about the time the NWO thing was starting up. And then I talked to Jim Hurd about coming in as, as the security for the NWO. And uh, they decided to go with Virgil instead, which is good because they clown Virgil and I would have never allowed them to clown me like that yeah i was going to ask have you ever had to throw virgil off uh, the strip club car park for trying to like sign sign autographs on your property <laughs> he wasn't doing that back then yours are too cheap to go to a strip club <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'll also ask this right uh, so you actually mentioned it before when you were papa shango um you didn't end up having the televised feud with the ultimate warrior but you ended up i think it might have even been the very last saturday night's main event on fox uh where you took on bret hart how do i mean where do you rank bret hart in the best of all time he's right up there bro hell of a worker he's right up there top five man great worker great worker uh, would you say that you like totally, uh, because you said before, you know, you were very inexperienced when you were in the WWF. So, I mean, it seemed like you weren't inexperienced at all with someone like Brett. Uh, you know, by the time I Brett. got to Brett, by the time I got to Brett, I was getting the gimmick down a little bit more. You know, so we were having better matches. It was the Warriors was the hard one because I, I wasn't there that long. Man. I was wrestling Tito Santana and then all of a sudden I went from Tito Santana to the Warriors. I'll, um, I'll finish on this and I'll let you go. Um, you're on Survivor Series 1997 card. I think you were th uh, third from the main event, actually. Uh, and I always like to ask the Montreal Screwjob question. Were you in the locker room at the time? Were you still in the arena no. at the time? I had already left. Ah, I, I, I didn't. All I know is whenever it happened, I was already left and somebody called me and told me about it. I don't know if I was on my way to the hotel, but I was not at the building when it happened. So you beat Earl Hebner out of the uh, arena that night? Huh? Yeah, you you beat Earl Hebner out of the arena that night. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, all I know about it is what what we hear on these stories and stuff. I mean, I really, you know. Uh, do you remember the scene at Raw the next evening at the Raw tapings? Were there like loads of people threatening to quit and everything like that? And by the time they I were threatening, that... but they were threatening to quit, but none of them did. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Vince coming in and basically saying, hey, this is my company. I'm going to protect my company. If anybody don't like it, we'll give you your release, basically. Oh, so you had like a big meeting like before the uh, taping. Yeah, I mean, that's basically how it went down. He's like, you guys can't live with this. I will always protect my company. I did, you know, it was that type of thing. If you don't like it, I'll give you your release. And I don't think nobody asked for their release. Did no. they? Um, Rick Rude left shortly after. And I think um, Brian Adams left uh, shortly after as well, but I don't know if that was to do with that or something else. Nah, I had nothing to do with that. At least I know Brian Adams. I know he didn't have nothing to do with that. I, I, do you know what? I'm going to ask this, right? Cheaters, uh, you've had the strip club for years and years and years. I'm not going to ask you like the regular question. How hard is it? Or I don't know if it's hard or easy. You just apply. 
how easy is it or hard is it to get a licensing, find a plot for a strip club? Is it like a bit more difficult in Vegas? Impossible. In Vegas, they don't give them out anymore. You can only do the withstanding ones. Okay. If a club closes and loses its license, they don't they throw the license out. So I think there's so many, I don't know how many licenses there are, but they're not any new ones coming. There's more dispensaries, marijuana, just because you know, marijuana is legal here, recreational. It's completely legal. There's more, there's more dispensaries than there are topless clubs. The topless clubs with the younger people your age and stuff. They're not so much in the topless clubs like we used to be. And they're really suffering worldwide. They're just younger cats today. They're just not into it. You know, things change, you know, but we didn't have, we didn't have social media and access to all the stuff that you have access to now. So we were, you know, doing our thing. <laughs> how, uh, how long did it take you for you to set up? I mean, was it just like a building that you just took over? In fact, actually more to the point, how did you get the license if it's practically impossible to get one? No, I didn't have the license. Ah. I didn't, I didn't have a license. Um, I just had a percentage and I'd worked there forever. And then over time I was given some percentage and then I bought into some percentage, but no, I wasn't on the license. I was the key employee, which means I was investigated and I wasn't on the license, but I was about as close as you could be to being a licensed owner. Mm. And so I had to answer to everything, but I was not on the license, not as I was on the license as a key employee, not an owner. Mm. Uh, not to get you in trouble with your misses, you, you can plead the fifth on this, but um, is it you personally who auditions the girls coming in? No. Managers. Yeah, I mean, it, you got girls, I mean, every day you got 10, 15 girls coming in. I don't have time for that, bro. That, that's what the managers and supervisors do. And no, really, you'd be there all day interviewing girls. I, I yeah. You know, I'd come out every now and then see, but I mean, you, I didn't have time to do that. <laughs> I'd have I time sounds, to do that. <laughs> you, get, you get tired of it because you also have other stuff you got to do. You got meetings. You got all type of stuff. I don't got time to go out here and look at 10 girls that might be here tomorrow or might not. You know, they might be going back to L.A. So now, um, you know, I was never part of that. I, you know. Uh, is it true? It seems like you're looking for a dicier answer. No, I'm not looking for a dicier answer. I, I'm genuinely interested. Uh, one other thing is, uh, I heard at some point Vince McMahon banned... Uh, all the wrestlers from going to strip clubs. Why was that? Because I, I, really I was go... there, he didn't. Oh, no? Not when I was there, he didn't. No, he did not. Oh, I don't right. know where you got that from. I think it was, uh, I think it might have been Kevin Nash who did an interview, like maybe, I don't know when it was. Up until the the last day I worked there, we were going to strip clubs, so I don't know what to tell you. Kevin, Kevin wasn't a strip club guy anyway. He wasn't part of that crew. <laughs> he'd go i mean he, i know i mean he would show i mean i mean me taker yokozuna rikishi macho man i mean that was a crew that every night not you know every night we went those other guys would just show up every now and then so i don't i don't know where he got that from and maybe they told him he couldn't go to topless clubs <laughs> but uh, that's where we live <laughs> <laughs> I'd, uh, well, there'd be a lot of there'd be a lot of topless clubs disappointed if you were banned. Then I suppose with all the money you were posting over the over the desk. Um, you got a lot of stuff for free. <laughs> so I always tell Taker. We I always tell I, I always tell. I wish I had some of that strip money back because we would throw it around, but not as much as you think, man. Because everything was free. You know, everything was on the cuff. I'll and have... if you got dances from the girls, you had to pay them. But, I mean, drinks and food were free. Um... Especially because they wanted you there because now they got Undertaker, Godfather, and somebody else inside their club. I mean, it makes their club look better. Yeah, you're right. You know? You're know, you absolutely right. Um, I'm going to go a little further on now. I'm going to give you a little personality test. I'm going to throw some uh, little sentences at you, and you tell me who best fits the bill for them. And you cannot say yourself. So you're right to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Last man standing at the bar. Taker. Uh, hottest diva or lady in real life, not on TV. I always loved Deborah McMichaels. Deborah was the coolest. Uh, anyway, Deborah. <laughs> uh, big uh, biggest bully. Bradshaw. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> and who was uh, who was most picked on? 
most picked on? New guys? Nobody. I mean, once you're established, you're not going to get picked on. and You're not going to make it. So maybe young, new guys that are coming in. I don't have a name. No. Um, I mean, sorry. if uh, you get picked on, you ain't going to last long if you get picked on. I mean, you're, no. you're not going to last. Uh, heaviest bench. Yeah. Every, heaviest bench press, heaviest deadlift, heaviest squat for you. For me? Yeah. Me personally? You personally. I have benched 580 pounds. I have squatted. I was, I've only squatted like 650 and I pulled like 600. Blinking. So I don't know what, I think my total was like 18.5 or something like 18, something like that. But this is, this is a long, long time ago when I was in the WWF and E, F and E, haha, <laughs> um, I could still, when I was Papa Shango and up until in the nation of domination, I was still putting up five bricks. We had, man, we had Mark Henry, me, Animal. Um, there was a um, Warlord, uh, Crush. There was like six or five or six guys that could bitch over 500 pounds. I bet you there's nobody there now that could bitch 500 pounds. Maybe Brown or one of them guys. Yeah, or Brock, maybe, even if he's not there uh, now. Brock can't put it back of weight. He's not a weightlifter. Um, the, the wrestler who uh, would be uh, go to the laundry the least? Uh, Vader. Just <laughs> so. Uh, I've never had an answer from this yet, but I'll ask you. Uh, biggest stooge for the dirt sheets. <laughs> uh, don't know. No. If I did, we'd be. If, if I did, I, I um um. If we knew of a stooge, we dealt with it. I mean, so. I mean, I, you could say, like we said, this guy's a stooge, that guy's a stooge. But if we knew about it, we dealt with it. Like I said, if you got picked on or like that, unless you're the top guy, you're going to have a hard time there because there's going to be people coming after you. <laughs> um, most memorable backstage fight? Mark, uh, 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 um, Ahmed Johnson and D'Lo Brown. <laughs> and D'Lo whooped his ass and D'Lo, see, D'Lo's a real wrestler. I mean, he was a collegiate wrestler. And D'Lo had him hooked so bad, and he's trying to tap out. And D'Lo had him hooked so bad that me and Ron had to tell D'Lo, let him go. Let him go, D'Lo, because D'Lo was going to break his arm or something. But that was the best one I see. Could you tell me what the precipitating, like, what, why did the fight happen in the first place? Because I heard that Ahmed Johnson was giving some grief to The Rock for some reason. I can't remember. <coughs> Don't know. Don't remember. I just remember D'Lo and him going at it. I don't remember why. Ahmed Johnson was, he just didn't get it. He didn't fit in with us either. And so he didn't get it. And everybody at that point, everybody couldn't stand him. I'm about the only guy that put, I, and you know, I, I'm about the only guy that probably doesn't have real nasty things to say about. It. I just tell people he didn't get it. Uh, he didn't get it, and we tried to help him, and he just didn't get it. Uh, one thing that I always, always ask people who were in the Brawl for All is everything about the Brawl for All tournament. Uh, I've spoke to Mark Mero, I've sp spoke to Savio Vega, as I said before, uh, but I'm always interested. I'm like the 1% that really loved it, because I just like seeing people fight. It doesn't matter if it's on the street or in the UFC. I just love <laughs> seeing people fight. Um, so the first time, when do you first hear about the tournament? Uh, how were you uh, first alerted? Bruce Pritchard called me and said, hey, they're going to do this thing where you put gloves on for two minutes. You can try to take the guy down. There are only two minute rounds. We're going to pay you five, ten thousand, whatever it was. If you win, you get more. And then you're fine. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> it went like that. He goes, I'm like, who else is in it? He goes, well, everybody we thought there was going to be in it. And they said they figured you were going to be. And I'm like, yeah, I'll do it, you know. Yeah. Uh, Out of that whole fiasco, though, only two people that survived that whole thing was me and Bradshaw that went on and, you know, but mostly every, it, it ruined a lot of careers. It almost got me because I got hurt. I, I hurt my leg real bad. I'm and so uh, it almost got me. Yeah, I'm going to ask you about that as well in a minute. But um, was it a curtain sellout for the uh, for all the other fights? Of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to skip ahead slightly here. So, obviously, we all know uh, Dr. Death was the most fancied to win the whole thing, and Jim Ross 
was uh, touting him as like the unbeatable guy. Who did you cheer more for when they got knocked out? Was it Dr. Death or was it Bradshaw? Nobody, nobody. Um, I, I, I talked with Steve about this yesterday. I, I don't, I don't know why anybody would think that Steve was good. Steve was an old man at that point. He wasn't that. And Steve was the tough guy 25 years before that. So the, I don't know why I don't understand it. I told someone, I don't understand why people thought that he would win. Maybe if he was 20 years younger, he might have. But uh, so I wasn't cheering for nobody to get knocked out, man, especially me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> your first fight was Dan Seven. Have you got any memories of Dan Seven? Because obviously, I mean, if it was wrestling and boxing at the same time, and Dan Seven's a world-class I, wrestler. I, I, I told people that's the only fight that I've ever lost where nobody ever hit me. But he got a couple of takedowns, and so he, that's why he won, but... I, I don't think he threw a punch. <laughs> I was trying to hit him. <laughs> do, you, do you remember? I actually, this is the only match I actually watched of yours uh, to prepare for the interview, and it was you versus Scorpio, and it was actually one of the first actual good matches of the Brawl for All. Tell me a bit about Scorpio. I rode to the building with him that day. We were riding together, and we get to the building, and then they like, they asked me if I wanted to be good back in it because... Severin or somebody bowed out and I'm like yeah I'll get back in it and they said well you got to fight uh, too cold I'm like ah oh, really I said all right so we, we went and had lunch and, and we were having lunch I'm like hey no matter what happens man let's stay cool with each other with this thing all right <clears throat> Vince was mad at me because Vince thought I could have knocked him out I did but he was my smoking buddy <laughs> but I mean that wasn't fair I was so much bigger than him that wasn't fair yeah, he had a bit of a rep as well because I know the year before he was in like some massive ECW brawl and he was like the star of it when he was in ECW. Did you hear about that at the time? No, a lot of that stuff. I, no, I have no. I'm, I'm not saying Flash being the tough guy, but I mean I, he was. I was just bigger than him, man. That wasn't fair. Uh, well, um, you ended up uh, uh, losing unfortunately to Bart Gunn. Uh, did you? Did he have a bit of a reputation in the back that was well known no. for being a bit of a tough guy? No. 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 He's a nice guy. I'm friends with him now. Um, you know, my the reason I lost that fight is I wasn't prepared. And that's it. I didn't prepare for it. I took it lightly. I just thought, I actually thought just being me, I was going to win it. I really did. And uh, I'd never lost a fight in my life before that. And uh, I just, I wasn't prepared. I mean, we had time to prepare. Was I going to the gym? No. Was I hitting the bags? No. Was I trying? No, 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 no. I just showed up, put the gloves on and fall. I should have prepared better. If I would have prepared better and then went down to the gym and said, okay, watch this guy. He's knocked out the last two guys. What should I watch out for? I should have prepared better and I didn't. And that's what happened. I got caught. I really thought I'd go through him with no problem. I really did. I'm like, I told him, dude, don't take this personally, this asthma that I would give you. <laughs> yeah, I really thought that I was going to, I really thought I was going to win. I was thinking, man, how am I going to fight this Butterbean guy? I was actually thinking, <clears throat> when I get to Butterbean, I'm going to have to get in the gym and actually get some training because he's a real boxer. But I didn't make it that far. But hey, you know, that's what happens. He'll prepare and I got caught. Yeah. I got caught by somebody that throws a hard right or left where that some bitch throws, he throws it hard. <laughs> Do you know, it's actually That's the one that gets you. I've never seen it coming. The one that hurts you the most is the one you don't see coming. Yeah, I believe. Um, you know, I actually did realize this until I was doing the research for the rock books. I actually make a, a point of mentioning this is that you ended up really hurting your leg. And I didn't realize how badly injured you were from it. Uh, and you said you were in a wheelchair at one point. Uh, um, I hurt my leg really bad. I wasn't in a wheelchair. Actually, I might have been in a wheelchair. Um uh, there's pictures out there you could dig up of it, but it blew out when I got knocked down. It, it all the way, it blew out my whole left leg, and I mean, blew out from my ankles to my thigh. It was my leg was completely blue, and um, it, it was a setback. It was just you know, yeah, I got hurt really bad in that, but I survived it. Uh, but it also ended up that you had time off, as it happens with so many people in injury. You have time off to really consider your character, and your wife ended up helping you come up with the Godfather, or actually fleshing out the Godfather character, didn't she? Uh, she, my wife, is the Godfather. I'm just the person portraying him. <laughs> uh, it was her idea. She had the costumes made, the jewelry made. All I did was the, the, the silly part. All that was her idea. Um. 
that was because I was in the nation and, we, and uh, the rock was kind of getting out of it. And Mark, Henry and Dilo were kind of tagging up. I wasn't doing anything. So actually I got the name because I told these hats that I wear, they're called Godfather hats. And inside the hat says Godfather. And so I used to wear them. So I told Rocky one day, I'm like, hey, Rock, when you say comma, don't call me comma, call me the Godfather. The minute that he called me the Godfather, everybody, everybody started calling me the Godfather. <laughs> Do you remember, this is actually a bit of an odd question, I suppose, because you may not remember it, but um, when you became the Godfather, as we know the Godfather, say, we know the, the, the flashy jewellery and everything like that, and the ladies coming out, were you meant to be a bad guy originally? Because it seemed like you were a bad guy one week, and then you were a good guy the next, how Vince Russo uh, sort of portrayed you. Vince Russo had nothing to do with the Godfather at all. He didn't do any writing for me uh nothing against it but he didn't write for me at all they couldn't write for me because they didn't know what to say i was never scripted i had carte blanche we had how much time we had in the finish anything else i said was up to me only time that i would be scripted is when they wanted you to mention a town mention an event i would have to say that but vince russo didn't write one line for me that was all me smoking and say, I'm going to say this on this week on TV. I'm going to say that. And I find out who I was wrestling. And I'm like, okay, this is what I'd be at home smoking going, man, I'm going to say this on TV. And my friends would be like, you're not going to say it. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. You know, <laughs> it was just, it was fun. Uh, just fun. It was over. It was fun. I wanted the character when we talked about it. I, I went to Vince about it and I wanted to be a heel. Vince <laughs> is like, I'm not going to have your big ass out there slapping girls around. Are you crazy? He goes, let's go your wife's route. Let's make you a likable pimp. And I was off and running. Yeah, it's They had no, they, I'm telling you, and nothing against the WWE. They had nothing to do with the Godfather. Not, not meaning they had nothing to do with the creativity of him. It's all me and my wife. And they let us go. They just let me be me. But that none of that was him saying, hey, why don't you? Only thing that they had to do with is Shane McMahon came up with the whole train. Oh, right. Shane McMahon goes, you got to do something where you send them in like a train, like train, and you wind up and then you hit them. That was all Shane's idea. He goes, call it the whole train. Speaking of the hoe train, in fact, I'd actually said as the engineer of the hoe train, as the as the driver, the master of the hoe train, how do you spell hose? Is it H-O apostrophe S or is it H-O-E-S? How do you do it? H-O apostrophe S. Good man. <laughs> uh, this is probably uh, something that I was going to ask, uh, and you may not know this either, but who uh, who was the person who was going to the local strip clubs and, and getting the ladies to come to TV that day? The first time we put girls on TV, because I was I was doing it without girls, not on TV, but in the house shows, I would say in the back right now in a limo waiting for you or something like that. And I would offer, it was Bradshaw, me and Bradshaw are the ones that started this. And it was Bradshaw that we, you know, we started and it was getting over big time. And uh, we went to TV and Vince says, Charles, can you get some girls? Can you put some girls to it? I'm like, are you joking me? Me, Taker, and the Harris boys, we went to a strip club and got some girls, and we brought them back. After that, it was over. The first night that we did it, it was such a great reaction that they took it over. And I think Bruce Pritchard was the first one that would, was starting it. And then they would just call strip clubs. And then as it got over on TV, strip clubs started calling them. And then as it got over even more, the events is like, I can't let these strippers keep I got to, I got to calm these girls down a little bit. So he went to model, he went to a modeling agency, right? But they were worse than the strippers. <laughs> they were worse than the strippers. So they are probably strippers too, that just models too. But you know, it was a good time. Uh, I've got something so specific that I, but it was so memorable and I cannot find the footage to it because I think it was like an international only version of heat. And it was like early 2000, you were wrestling and you're on one side of the ring and the ladies were on the other and you beckoned one of them over and the ring was so bouncy that one of them ended up missing a footing and doing a Ric Flair bump on, on her front complete, like bump like that. Do you remember this or is it only in my head? I don't remember that one time, but it happened a lot because your girls would have those high heels on 
And it happened more than one time. So I don't remember that one because, and plus it had to walk down the ramp or the ramp was graded, man. It had holes that had those shoes on and then they'd get in the ring. And yeah, I mean, they, I, I remember two, I used to tell the girls, if you fall down, don't just don't worry about it. I'll fall down with you or something, you know, and it happened a couple of times and I fell down with her. We got up, everybody laughed. But it was it was hard for them, man, because they had those high heel shoes on in that ring. I've I've got to ask this as well. Who was the main culprit who was sniffing around the ladies backstage? All of them. All of them. <laughs> I ain't gonna give all of them. There was a there see at that point, I wasn't like I said, I've been married over 20 years. At that start time, I'd stop messing around with girls. So that whole godfather thing, I never messed with any of the girls. <laughs> But a lot of the boys did. I'm not going to give up nobody's names, but there was a lot of them after the girls. And those girls were all wrestling fans, so it was pretty easy. Mm. Got a signature as well, of a sort, I'm sure. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> um, do you know what, right? I'm going to throw some names at you. Uh, I call it the firing line, so I'm going to fire a few names at you. And uh, you tell me if they're cool. You tell me uh, what you think of them. Generally, I mean, you, you say everyone's cool because you're just like the nicest dude in the world. Uh, but if you've got a funny story to throw at me at the same time, please feel free. Um, and the first one is Tiger Ali Singh. Didn't know him that well. Seemed to be a cool dude. I worked with him a couple of times, but I didn't know him that well. But he seemed, I think he was from Canada. He seemed like a nice guy. Or what do you want me to say, cool or not cool or no, if you've got a funny story, I, I'm not. No, I'm not telling you if you don't like him or like him. And you say I, I whatever don't know you want about. Well, I worked with him a couple of times, but he seemed like a cool dude. Yeah. Uh, Jamie Dundee. Jamie Dundee. Giant killer. <laughs> I'm gonna let it go with that. Giant killer. Yeah. The 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 world's toughest, smallest man in the the toughest, smallest guy in the world. Giant killer. <laughs> Paul Bearer. Oh yes. Uh, good joint roller, man. He could roll the best <laughs> joints. I wasn't expecting that. He rolled the best joints, bro. He rolled perfect joints. Mantor. Don't didn't remember him too much. I didn't hang out with him. What was his real name? I don't. Um, I just remember the didn't know him that well. Okay, uh, Sonny. Number one hoe in the world. <laughs> Biggest hoe in the world. Nastiest uh, hoe in the world. Ooh. Let me keep going. Yes. This piece of shit in the world. <laughs> you want me to keep going? Yes. You know, piece of shit. Enough said. <laughs> Enough said. Uh, Chief J. Swimbo. I mean, she's probably in jail now, right? I bet you she's in jail. Oh, I probably. bet you any amount of money right now she's in jail. Uh, I, I actually spoke to Johnny Candido, um, Chris's brother. And God, he had so much to say about her as well. So it, it, she was just fresh on my mind. Uh, she's just, she's just, she's just the, she's not, she's just a piece of shit. But, uh, Chief J Strongbow. Wish I would have listened to him more when I first broke in. Good guy, really good guy. He tried to give me some advice that I shied from, and to this day, I wish, man, I wish I would have listened to him. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Cornette. Uh, Jim Cornette, cool dude. Been around wrestling a long time. Got no problems with Jim Cornette. Cool dude. Uh, Kerry Von Erich. Ah, oh, man. Sad story. Good guy. Great wrestler. Nice dude. Missed. Mabel. Um, Mabel. Is that meaning Viscera and Mabel? Yeah, Viscera, Big Daddy V, mate. Yeah, right. Nelson Fraser. Uh, was Nelson, was Big Daddy V was Mabel? Yeah. Um, what was the other guy's name? Mabel and the other guy. But anyway, good dude, Mister. I rode with him a lot, smoked with him a lot. He actually stayed at my house, at another house that I had a couple of times when he was here. Um, good guy. I rode with him a lot. He taught me how to roll a blunt. <laughs> yes, really, he taught me how to roll a blunt. <laughs> Just tell you. Uh, I actually wrote this. I didn't mean it to rhyme. I've said Mabel Sable. Sable was cool. Uh, I wasn't. I, I wasn't around Deborah much more than Sable, but Sable was cool. I didn't talk with her much. She kind of didn't really hang around. But I'd see Deborah McMichael. We did cardio in the morning all the times. Me, her, and Teddy Long, and we talk all the time. Just cool, really nice person. But uh, uh, Sable, good girl. 
Teddy Long cool. wasn't doing cardio. You can't tell me he was doing cardio. Surely. Teddy Long is the cardio champion of the world. Really? Nobody could do more cardio than Teddy Long. Listen to me. Uh, he can go two hours on a treadmill running. Wow. And he's like 70 something years old. I, I used to get, I'd smoke in the morning. We'd smoke in the morning. And then we'd go do cardio. And if it was in the, whatever, but we'd always do cardio. And I, to this day, I could do an hour cardio, no matter what I could do an hour. I can go over there right now and do an hour cardio because I did so much with Teddy. I don't know where I got this little cough from. I did so much with Teddy that you learn how to breathe. And once you learn how to breathe, cardio is easy, like mm. anything. Uh, Ackham Albrecht. I think he was Brackus. He was the bodybuilder, the German guy. Brackus. <clears throat> Wasn't he Ludwig Borga? No, that was Tony Halm. He was um, he was the Nordic geezer. Yeah, Barack. I don't remember Barakas. I remember the name. Uh, Nails. Good guy. What from that Minnesota? That Minnesota crew. Good guy. You know. Uh, I don't suppose you were that. You, you were. Were you in the uh, arena when yeah, the I was throttling there. thing happened? It happened in the locker room. I was there. Oh, I was. I was there. Were you actually watching him do it? I was there. I didn't see it happen, but I heard it happening, but I was there. <laughs> I've got a few more. King Kong Bundy. King Kong didn't know him well, um, but he was a good guy. He was cool. He's funny. He was always he's a funny guy. Uh, Marty Janetti. <laughs> still living the dream, baby. Marty Jannetty's still living the dream. God bless him, man. He's, he's going to hang on to the end. He's going to go out partying, baby. <laughs> so he's the same as he was 30 years ago. So God bless him. I think he just had an operation on his leg, I think. So I wish him well. But he's still he's still that 1980 Marty Jannetty. <laughs> Did you ever rock and roll with him on an evening out? You must have done. Now, um he he would show up at the strip clubs every now and then, but he wasn't part of the group. We had a like I said, BSK was our group. That's who we hung around. Uh, and one more, Owen Hart. Ah, missed. Good dude. Great dude. Great wrestler. Good friend. Uh, I I also wrote a uh, book uh, like collating all of Owen Hart's ribs, and I think about like a hundred and sixty of them. And it's like a massive book as well. <laughs> and uh, I don't think there was, I ever found one from you. Uh, do you have any that happened to you or that you were around? If Owen ever ribbed me, I don't know about it. Most people, I don't, I never got ribbed. Not because I'm tough or not. I just, people didn't rib me. I don't, I'm, I'm you know, I don't think they were afraid to rib. Marty Jeanette, oh, that's right. Marty Jeanette tried to rib me once. And oh, Kurt Henning. Kurt Henning tried to rib me once. That's right. Uh, but Marty Janetti was trying to put a lock on my locker, right? And Scott Hall or somebody came and said, hey, Marty's in there putting a the lock on your locker. So I went there and caught him red-handed. <laughs> so uh, and then uh, it was a Scott Hall, uh, Kurt Henning rib, but it, was, it wasn't on me. It was really on Scott because me and Kurt kind of, you know, double-dipped on him. So what was the uh, Kurt Hennig one? I don't remember oh. it had so i don't remember and it was a thing it was a thing where kurt was like doing commentary so he was kind of in the office and I, it was something about kurt was gonna bury me in the office it was something it was funny before i uh let you go give us some plugs uh are you plugging anything at the moment have you got anything uh you want to get out there yes I, my biggest thing is instagram if people make sure you follow me on instagram i am the godfather verified as the godfather and I'm verified as the WWE Godfather. I'm really heavily involved in the cannabis business, but being in Cal that's in California, so I don't think you guys know good. So just follow me on Instagram, man. See what I'm doing. I do a lot of cool stuff and yeah. crazy stuff and just silly stuff. It's technically illegal here still, but they don't even, even if you're growing oh. it in your house, they won't bother. <laughs> well, if you're offended by smoking, don't watch my videos. There's a <laughs> lot of smoking on them. See, it's no longer. See, did you see my shirt? It's no longer the whole train. It's the smoke train. Let's have a look at it. It's the smoke train. Nice. That's nice. the bad. Yeah, that's my. So we um, had to give up the hose, and now it's just smoking. Yeah. Where can uh, where can people pick a 
uh, smoke train up t-shirt? Um, it's prowrestlingtees.com. Right, so then I'll tell you what, I'm going to do the sign-off now. So listen, thank you so much for listening uh, and watching or whatever you're doing uh, to absorb this podcast or YouTube show. I can't do the intros, I can't do the outros. I've messed every single one up. But I will thank you so much for watching and uh, thank you, Godfather, for joining me and we will right. see you next week, man. Thanks for having me, my brother. Peace, everybody. Yeah.